This small bottom dwelling fish, originally from the Black and Caspian Sea, is now in all of the Great Lakes. Their appetite for destruction begins with native fish eggs and ends with plankton and other small invertebrates. Their voracious appetite and prolific spawning has left an indelible mark on the environment. The round goby is just one more enemy in this daily battle with the silent invaders. Nearly everyone loves to watch in awe as impressive transoceanic ships from all over the world parade through the harbors of the Great Lakes. But in addition to the cargo they carry, many believe exotic species unintentionally go along for the ride and are forced to find new homes in the foreign waters of North America. This is Milwaukee Harbor. Show them Milwaukee Harbor. See, this is the inner harbor. There's big ships around which is probably how they got here, uh, out of ballast water from one of those ships. Ballast water is held in tanks of ships to help increase the stability during transit. Sometimes, living in that water are aquatic creatures from places like the Black and Caspian Seas. They are the silent invaders that survive the long trip in the bellies of these massive ships. When the ballast water is dumped into the harbor, the creatures go with it. Among the most notorious are zebra and quagga mussels and a fish with a big head and frog-like eyes called the round goby. And they leaped out of the ship and said, hey, I love this St. Clair River. I think I want to live here. David Jude is a research scientist at the University of Michigan. He's been studying the ecology of the Great Lakes since 1973. David Jude is known for an important discovery he made near Detroit. I found the first goby back in uh, 1990. I was working in the St. Clair River. We saw them in the St. Clair River, then we saw them in the Grand River in Lake Erie, and then they jumped to the Calumet River in uh, Lake Michigan, and then into Duluth Superior Harbor. So it was not that they swam from place to place, they were transported from place to place by freighters. And as with any aquatic species that are not native to the Great Lakes, gobies compete with the fish that are. One of the first things that they've done is they have eliminated essentially three uh, species, groups of fish. Those fish are sculpins, the log perch, and darters, another member of the perch family. So these are bottom-dwelling benthic fish and they compete directly uh, with the round goby. So, so we're losing those species in areas uh, where they overlap. The round goby competes with the native species for food, drives them from their spawning areas, and even eats their eggs. The harbors they get dumped into are usually perfect breeding grounds, and so their population explodes. They spawn on the undersides of rocks or perhaps a, a log in the, in, the, in the bottom. They'll dig a hole underneath that. They deposit their eggs on the top of that uh, structure. And then four or five, up to ten females will come into that little area and uh, mate with that particular male. Goby spawn several times from May through August, unlike most native fish that spawn just once. So when gobies enter an area, it becomes infested with them. They're like bullies that move into a new neighborhood and force the current residents out. And the problem is, gobies are finding new places to live all the time, with a little help from humans. This is the spot where we think fishermen brought uh, gobies from the Great Lakes oh. to use for bait and dumped them in here. This is the Flint River, not far from the University of Michigan campus. David has picked this warm fall afternoon to continue his goby research. With help from an assistant, he uses a seine he created specifically to capture small fish here to study their expanding population. We've done other research here in the past, so we know there's a lot of round gobies in this area, and they've had a real detrimental impact on the, on the darters that are in, on, in the river here. Four species of darters are no longer found in the Flint River as the result of the goby. Until recently, gobies didn't exist here, and there is no natural way for them to get into this water. But game fish, like the smallmouth bass, have learned to eat gobies, so some anglers are using them for bait. David suspects it was an angler who brought the invasive to the Flint River, and it's changed the future of other fish forever. That's what usually happens when they come into a system. They either eat their eggs 
or they compete with them for food, or they, uh, you know, dominate the, the, these darters and these, and these systems, and then you find mostly uh, round gobies in, in, in the uh, fish communities. Here we have probably a typical seine haul for the Flint River. We're getting probably 50 to 60 percent of the number of fish that were collected are round gobies again. Since the gobies arrived here, another exotic invasive has found its way to the neighborhood the rapidly populating zebra mussel. Well, here's a rock with some typical zebra mussels in it. And you can see why round gobies have a pretty good food supply. Gobies eat their invasive neighbors, the zebra mussels, which sounds like a positive, but they only consume the small ones. And then when they get this big, of course, they're very fecund, they can produce lots of uh, zebra mussels, and, and the round goby essentially is having no effect at all on their population. There are so many zebra mussels around, the gobies have an abundant food supply, which keeps the goby population vibrant and growing. And then there is an interesting phenomenon involving gobies and zebra mussels that David Jude says he could never have predicted. Because the zebra mussels clear the water, we're, we're getting more algae growing on the bottom, that algae then washes to shore, it rots on the shore, it, and then that creates a positive environment for botulism. And then the zebra mussels filter the botulism, round gobies eat the zebra mussels, and then we've got top predators uh, like fish and um, loons eating those gobies, and then they're dying as a result of that. So, gobies eat zebra mussels, and large predator fish, the kind anglers like to catch, eat gobies. In areas where the water is contaminated, the zebra mussel's ability to ingest PCBs creates a potential health risk to some humans. And then we've got this contaminant problem too. Uh, people shouldn't be eating round gobies from areas that are contaminated and probably not of the, none of the top predators as well. I would call the gobies an evolving issue. It's, it's like I, if I could redo the system and get rid of them, you know, I would do it. I'd say this, this is not something that's good for the Great Lakes. We got evil fish coming into town. Oh, there's egg sucking, fish biting, exotics all around. Coming up, who's winning the battle between the smallmouth bass and the round goby? Silent Invaders is a production of the North American Media Group in cooperation with the Environmental Protection Agency and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and by the USDA Forest Service, Wildlife Forever, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, and these other organizations. For most of its 10,000 years of life, the Great Lakes was protected by the Niagara Falls from invasions of non-indigenous species. But in the early 1800s, the Welland Canal was carved out, allowing ocean-going ships to bypass the falls and enter the Great Lakes. And with the large vessels came an aquatic species whose natural home is in the Black and Caspian Seas. Since its arrival in North America, the round goby has slowly made its way from one Great Lake to another. This strange-looking, diabolical fish forces many native species out of their territory and even eats their eggs. There's no question they consume smallmouth bass offspring, and any offspring consumed is one less that could survive to be an adult. Jeff Steinhardt is the co-director of the Aquatic Research Lab at Lake Superior State University in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. He's been studying the effects of the round goby's explosive populations in the Great Lakes since 1999. When you're diving in Lake Erie, the numbers of round gobies, you feel like they're going to all swim up and, and carry you away because there's so many of them in such a small place. Using Lake Erie as his stage, Jeff Steinhardt has diligently videotaped the constant battle between the smallmouth bass protecting its eggs and the round goby who wants to consume them. Watch here, we've got a goby coming in from the right. Okay. Okay, and as soon as the male chases him, a goby will come in again from the other side. Uh -huh. The, but the male makes it back in time to chase it away. If you ever watch a smallmouth on the bed, God bless them. I mean, they're just nonstop. You know, they're racing around in the bed and they're trying to maintain 
their babies so they can hatch out, you know. Because gobies are such voracious egg eaters, professional anglers like Dale Strohshine believe that fishermen should not lure the smallmouth bass off its nest during the spawning season. There is some research out there that shows when you take fish off the beds that the gobies do come in and, and potentially can attack the bed, you know, and devastate the bed for lack of better terms. And um, I, I think it's something that as a guide, you know, we really need to look at. What we found was that uh, when an angler removed the bass, it took less than a minute for the first goby to enter that unguarded nest. And then those gobies would start to swarm into the nest and within 15 minutes they could consume every offspring. You know, I'm sure the fish are down there going, okay, well, you know, what's going on here? You know, where, what is this thing? Where did it come from? What is it doing? As well as being a professional guide, Dale Strohshine owns the Sand Bay Beach Resort in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. He's been fishing since he was six years old. A display case of trophies and photographs pretty much tells the story of his popularity and success in the fishing industry and the constant evolution between the smallmouth bass and the round goby intrigues him. All of a sudden they're eating their eggs, they're, you know, they're doing, you know, uh, they're tormenting them and they're, they're just, you know, it's like a little kid in grade school, you know, and you had always the bully, you know, the goby's kind of the bully to these fish and, okay, well, here, I, f I figure this out, I'll just eat you. Uh, young smallmouth bass are growing better in Lake Erie than they ever have before and we've hypothesized that that's because they're able to switch to a high energy round goby diet at a very young age. And it's not only the bass that are eating the round goby. A lot of the top predators in a system, if they eat fish, they will eat round gobies. So the fishermen have discovered this. Gobies are popular bait now and using gobies for bait, I don't have an issue with it as long as you're not moving them. Moving fish not only can introduce new species, but you can spread diseases, and this is something we've seen frequently across the Great Lakes, across North America, and across the world. Steve Panaz, another professional angler and host of the television series North American Fisherman, says there's an alternative to using live gobies as bait. You know, as an angler, I view the round goby much in the same way that I view the alewife. Both are invasive species, and both have changed the Great Lakes possibly forever. The alewife's a primary prey species of the Salmata. It's fish like the coho and king salmon. And they were actually stocked by the state of Michigan back in 1960 in an effort to control alewife numbers, which has had exploded with the lack of lake trout in the lake. Sport fish are also finding the round goby as viable prey. In fact, a lot of species seem to be keen on them. Smallmouth bass that love gobies, and goby imitating baits like this made by Berkeley and several other companies are deadly during the spring and summer months but there's an exciting other fishery that's emerging as well, and that's shallow lake trout during the spring, which move up shallow to break walls and harbor mouths and shallow rock reefs, favorite haunts of the round goby, and feed on these baits heavily. I guess what we're learning is that the round goby is changing the face of sport fishing in the Great Lakes. Coming up, round gobies have found their way out of the Great Lakes and are headed south. The wind howls. The water crashes against the shore. It's a blustery fall day in Door County, Wisconsin. It's pretty inclement out here today with this wind. We've got rain. It's quiet right now with the rain, but uh, trying to just get over in a protected area right now just to see if we can find some fish. Dale Strohshine is a professional angler, guide, and resort owner. Just outside his window is Sand Bay a small cove that connects to the larger Green Bay and eventually Lake Michigan. Strohshine is proud of the diversity of trophy fish he helped his clients pull from these waters. We're a force to be reckoned with on the Great Lakes. But these days, invasive aquatic species continue to find new homes here. And with them come new challenges for the angler. If you don't play your cards right, all you're going to do is end up going home with gobies. The round goby is a strange looking fish that found its way to North America from Europe in the ballast water of large ships. Its population is exploding in the Great Lakes, its rivers, and tributaries, including Green Bay. The numbers of bottom feeding gobies are so high in some areas that fishing for walleye or smallmouth bass can be a real challenge. As soon as that bait gets to the bottom, boy, it's just boom, 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 boom. I mean, just instantaneously when that bait gets to the bottom, there, there, aha, there's the culprit right there. Look at that little guy. 
never think that something like that would be so aggressive. And they do get bigger, up to 10 inches in some areas. And if you don't stay off the bottom, you're not gonna wanna fish because again, you'll be continually just taking those gobies off the line. Just by their massive numbers alone, round gobies dominate the fish population wherever they are. In places in the southern basin of Lake Michigan, they've been found as dense as 40 to 70 per square meter. And if you think about your bathtub, about a square meter, and if you had 40 to 70 four inch round gobies in there, you wouldn't want to put your big toe in that. So that's what our native fish would be up against, just competing for space as well. Until recently, the round goby was restricted to the Great Lakes region, but the prolific little fish is now headed south. So they're certainly headed downstream toward the Mississippi River. It's a summer morning on the Illinois River. The water has a golden glow from the early sun. But judging by the surface, there's little sense for the turmoil below the constant fighting for position between native and invasive species. The morning stillness is broken by the sound of a pickup truck with a John boat in tow. Two young college students working for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in La Crosse, Wisconsin, are headed out on the river to look for round gobies. This has been occurring every summer for the past 15 years. So we are surveying to see if there are any moving this far south yet. They are located about 40 miles south of Peoria, Illinois, which is the midway point between Lake Michigan and the Mississippi River. A year earlier, a goby was discovered just north of here. So their job this summer is to determine how much closer to the Mississippi River the gobies may have traveled in a year's time. Uh, just a crayfish looks like and another small minnow. There are 13 traps, like this one, spread out over a distance of a mile. They'll pull each trap today, check it for gobies, and then reposition them along a different stretch of river. But as they cruise down the water in search of gobies, they are bombarded by another invasive that has infested this area, the Asian carp. Wow. <laughs> the Illinois River is like a revolving door for invasive species in and out of Lake Michigan. There's the downstream movement of Great Lakes invasives like um, zebra mussels and the round goby. And now there's the upstream movement of big head and silver carp. One by one, as the goby traps are checked, a record is kept of all the aquatic life they discover along the way. Number 17. Number 17. 1022. 1022. Um, four bluegill. Four bluegills. Two sheephead. Over 100 traps have been set so far, and not one goby has been found. Which is a very good thing. Coming up, the pros and cons of gobies. This is the Milwaukee Harbor. It's a great place to have a laboratory if part of your job is to study the eating habits of gobies. The Great Lakes Water Institute has a home on the harbor. And as a scientist here, part of John Jansen's challenge is to find out what round gobies are eating. We have in this bag a round goby that was deep frozen. Uh, and we're now going to do some processing of it to find out what it's been eating. Opening up its stomach reveals what it's been eating recently. But to find out what it's been eating in the last few weeks and months, this has to happen. Well, now the uh, goby's going to get ground up in the goby version of Dan Aykroyd's Bassomatic. And there we go. Chopping up gobies in a coffee grinder homogenizes the fish so lab technicians can study its cells. But basically, it boils down to this. If the fish are over about four inches, their diet is usually mostly um, zebra mussels, quagga mussels. That is a good thing, except some scientists believe gobies don't eat enough quagga mussels to make a significant dent in their massive population. If yeah, it's less than about two inches, it's usually feeding on uh, aquatic insects or shrimp-like things called amphipods. That is a bad thing because gobies are stealing the food supply away from many native fish. They also eat the eggs of smallmouth bass and are forcing out small forage fish like sculpins and darters from their natural habitat. But the smallmouth bass have learned to eat gobies, and that's a good thing. 
And now we've seen a lot higher survival of smallmouth bass in, uh, in lakes like Lake Erie and uh, where before they weren't uh, that abundant. So there may be pros as well as cons to this strange looking fish, but the bottom line is the round goby is still an invasive species. I would say that there's never a positive um, effect of invasive species. <clears throat> you're upsetting the food web, you're upsetting the balance of nature, and so that's never a healthy situation. It would be best if we had no invasive species. Well, you know, if I had a magic wand, I'd say gobies be gone, uh, because certainly they have been, I think, more of a detriment in the Great Lakes than, than a positive aspect. Oh, I'm depressed, overwhelmed, with a galloping goby blues. Those gobies are forever. dad taught me to always pick my battles. I was surprised there weren't more efforts being done to stop the spread of round gobies. Certainly, there are many important issues, but working to stop the spread of invasive species is critical. Remember, never transport live gobies to another body of water.